Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. We've got a great Ask Jason for you today. I've got somebody who's coming into a Series A as an angel investor, and they want to know how to shape their bet. Should they put in 5, 10, or should they go jump the fence and put in 25, 50? Huh? I answer that question. And somebody is running a company as an international student, and they're trying to figure out how do they deal with their visa issues. We solved that one. A lot of commentary on these big tech layoffs has been going on and the soft bank crises with all these companies like WeWork. Somebody asked me, is this the new normal? And is this a trend beyond the soft bank companies? I answer that. And a really great question. What are the first time mistakes that founders make over and over again that I can avoid as a founder? I answer that question as well. And some another angel investor asked me, why are investors such lemmings and look for a high quality lead before they invest? There's three reasons, and I give them all on today's. All Ask Jason This Week in Startups. Stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Zapier, the easiest way to automate your work. It connects all your business software and handles the work for you so you can focus on what matters most. Right now through February, try Zapier free for 14 days by going to zapier.com slash twist. LinkedIn, a business is only as strong as its people and every hire matters. Go to linkedin.com slash twist and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. And Health IQ. Take as little as 20 minutes to save up to 41% on life insurance premiums compared to other providers at healthiq.com slash twist. All right, we got another Ask Jason caller. This is from an angel investor. For all you founders, you get to listen in on angels talking in the room where it happens. Peter from Seattle, you're back on the show. Hey, Jason. Good to hear from you. You and I invest together. You're a part of the syndicate.com. And you called on the last episode and we talked a little bit about angel investing. You have another question for me. Let's hear it. Sure. Uh, do you size your investments based on the round, that you, the round that you initially invest with a startup? For instance, if you typically put 5000 in at seed and 25000 if it's doing great at Series A, how much would you invest with a company if you start with them at the Series A? Yeah, great question. Great question. So I am a big fan of starting small and then doubling, tripling, quadrupling your bet on subsequent rounds, depending on the performance of the company. Now, there is one mitigating factor here, which is your overall uh, bankroll. So if you've decided that over the next five years, you're going to invest $250,000 in startups, I might suggest trying to put, let's say, $5,000 into 30 startups each, that's 150 k keeping that last $100,000 in reserve for the top five companies, four companies, six companies, something in that range, which means that last 100000 would be divided by four, five, or six. You might be putting in fifteen to 25000 into each of those companies. Now, why would you do this kind of bet, uh, these follow-on bets in this fashion? Well, most startups fail, and so you get to know the 30, Probably only out of your 30, six will make it 20% to Series A, maybe even just 10%, three. And so if they make it to Series A, then you want to bet more because you've proven that this is a winner. And the people who invest at Series A in a winner, they do really well. Not as good as the seed investors, but pretty much the same. It could be pretty close because the valuation when you did your seed investment was likely six, seven, or eight million. And the Series A is likely 12 to 20 million. Am I... In this specific instance, are my numbers correct in terms of the valuation? Uh, you went a little fast for me, to be honest. <laughs> okay, so your your valuation for the Siri, the angel round when you invested was six, seven, eight million. Sure, that? that's typical. Yep, and then the Series A typically twelve million to twenty million, correct? Correct. Great. So if you just think about it, if you put you know ten k into each of those rounds, you're going to be in a similar place at the exit. Um, you're going to have made a multiple on that and you've done well. So I think four to one, five to one is what I'm comfortable with. So if you put in five, you go to 25. But let's say you just missed the, series, the seed series ah, and, and now you're coming in at the A. Yeah. So if you're typically putting in, let's say, five, 10K at the seed and you would be following on uh, to the series A, 25K or something, uh, you might take that same strategy and just put in 10k in that series a i don't think you need to put more into the series a um, you just want to make sure that there's a there's going to be a minimum so for a series a if you're doing a series a if you're from a syndicate the minimum might be five or 10k if you're doing it direct 
it's likely a minimum of 25 to 50K. And so that is the one challenge. And the one piece of advice I have is you can go to the founder and say, hey, I know your minimum is 50K for your Series A. Is it possible I'm a value added angel? Can I put in just 10? Uh, but I'm going to add a lot of value. Can you make an exception for me? I would say four to five times you're going to get that exception. Uh, so don't yeah. be afraid to, to ask because I have people do that to me uh, when I raise a fund. And I'll have somebody who's a friend of mine say, listen, Jason, I really want to be in your fund. I can't hit the minimum of 100K or something. Can I put in 50 or 25? And I'm like, you know what? Of course. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they'll make an exception. Like rules are, are made to have exceptions. So I, I would still put in a small amount of money. And then if they do great, then in the Series B, you could put in a little bit more. Okay, great. Do you, do you have time for one more? Yeah, go ahead. Of course. Sure. Um, let's talk about startups that get a lead on a Series A, but they're not the the escape velocity guys. They're marginal. Yeah. Uh, what factors do you consider in that situation? Uh, whatever it is, uh, they're going up 50% a year, year over year, but they're never going to truly take off. Yeah. So this is one of the biggest challenges in investing is what I'll call businesses that are good but not great. The entire concept of angel investing and, and investing in startups is about having outliers, right? You want to hit that unicorn investment. You want to hit that outlier in order to have a 50 to 100x, not percent, x return. So you put in a dollar, you get 50 back or 25 back or $100 back for every dollar you put in. Those kind of outcomes happen uh, frequently in Silicon Valley, uh, but it takes a lot of misses to get there. And so if you know a company is only growing 25%, 50% year over year, what the management team has likely proven is that they can build a good company, but not an outlier company. I have very rarely seen companies growing at 50% a year suddenly have a breakout year of growing revenue three or four X. It can happen, uh, but most VCs will look at a business that's three or four years old, and if it's only growing 50% year over year, they'll say, you know, that's never going to get you $100 million. And what we're looking for as investors is companies in 2020, uh, in case people are listening to this in 2050, um, and it's an archival document, um, you want a company that can hit 50 to $100 million in yearly revenue. In order to get there, you can't start at a million and then go from a million to a million five, a million five to 2.5, a million, 2.5 to four. It's just never going to get there. What you really want is triple, 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 double, double. So you want somebody who can get to a million in revenue, then three, then nine, then 20, then 40. And that's pretty typical. We see triple, 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 double, double many times in our lives. Um, and if they can't, it means they probably don't have very strong product market fit and they don't have a great go-to market strategy or they have massive competitors or the founding team is just not moving fast and aggressive. So it can be some connection of um, reasons there. And then if when you're looking at a deal, if it is being led by a, a really strong Series A, company, Series A firm, Sequoia, Benchmark, Excel, et cetera, those companies, uh, those firms are specialists in knowing high growth. So if they make a bet, they're going to make a bet on something that's high growth. They're not going to make a bet on something that's slow growth or no growth. Uh, and the people who might make those bets might be tier three, tier four firms. So if you're going with a new firm that's tier three or tier four, in other words, firms that haven't had unicorns, they didn't invest in Google, Facebook, Twitter, Tesla, whatever, they didn't, they, they've never invested in an outlier. You have to ask yourself, like, why am I following that person? Is there another opportunity in the world for me that would be better? And there are enough companies that are doubling or better. So look for the companies that are 2Xing or 3Xing revenue in the early stage. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Remember, it's, it's, it's really about consistently having a strategy of you know, making those 30 small bets and then you know, doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on the winners. Make small bets as you go and you learn. How many total bets have you made? 25, give or take. Perfect. So now you're starting and you've done that over two years? Uh, yeah. Perfect. So now you've got 25. How is your signaling now compared to when you started? Uh, I, I think I'm a lot better, but yep. also all I've seen are the dead ones, you know? Right. Uh, and that's, so. that's, the, that's the challenge of being in your sophomore and junior year as an angel investor. What happens in the first two or three years is all the losers, all the companies that are shutting down, 
they shut down fast, right? Because they only raise a year or two of runway. So if it doesn't work, if the experiment known as a startup fails, you're going to find out in year one, two, or three. So of those 25, you have 10 that are dead right now, 15, I would guess. Something in that range. Not even that. Maybe one or two. I mean, oh. there's some zom there's some zombie type things where it's, yeah. it, it, God bless, it's a matter of time. But, right. Yeah. Perfect. So if you have two shutdowns and maybe eight zombies, you're doing pretty good because what you're looking at is the magnitude of the wins, not the yeah. number of losses. So let me just mm -hmm. say that again for people listening. It's the magnitude of the win, not the total number of losses. If one of those 25 goes 50x, you've doubled your money if you bet the same amount in each company. So that's what you're looking for, is you're looking for the company out of those 25, or maybe even two companies or three companies, that'll define your returns. In my career, my top three companies are over 90% of my returns. That's out of 200 companies. Let that sink in. At the end of the day, my career is gonna be made by Uber, Calm, Robinhood, uh, Thumbtack, Datastacks, Wealthfront, probably that cohort, desktop metal. And there might be one or two other, there might be another five that are going to break out at some point. But uh, Fitbot comes to mind, Lead IQ. But really, those top ones right now on my book of business are 95%. And so what you have to do is just be very graceful on the losses and then bet as much as you can into those winners. You're okay. doing, I think you're doing it right. So, so keep at mm -hmm. it. Well, fingers crossed and thank you for the encouragement. All right, man. Good job, Peter. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Talk soon. Bye. Cheers. Bye. All right, we're back with another Zap of the Week. Remember, Zapier makes you happier. And at launch, one of the things we're looking to do is gauge interest in our events. And we're setting up ads on Facebook to collect leads. For example, we have Angel University and we did a tour last year. So we set up lead ads and we targeted investors. We then set up a Zap to collect those leads and sent automated emails inviting them to attend one of the available dates because we had multiple events. And as we did that, we sent notifications to Slack so the whole team knew what was going on. You do the lead gen ad, then you do a zap to send the email, and then you do another zap to let everybody on the team know. Whatever it is, we keep everybody up to date and in the loop. Zapier is the easiest way to automate your work. What you need to do as a startup, because you have limited resources, is analyze. Anything that takes more than an hour a month, anything that takes five hours a month, certainly. And you look at Zapier and you start connecting stuff. You make the glue between Google Docs, between Airtable, between Slack, between Salesforce, between Zendesk, between email, any of these tools. And we're talking about thousands of them now. You can instantly engage leads and send them a CRM or into your spreadsheet. And you integrate with over 1,500 business applications. Build the exact solution you need in minutes without having to hire a developer. Your developer should be working on your project, your software, not this operational stuff. That operational stuff, you can do it now with Zapier. So go to Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R dot com slash twist and connect the apps you use most. And Zapier will take it from there. Here is your call to action, everybody. Join more than 4.5 million people who are saving on average 40 hours a month. That's 40 hours you can put back into your customers, into your product, into your life, and having life work balance, if that's what you're going for. Right now through February, you can try Zapier for free by going to our special link. This is right. You can get it for free right now. Zapier.com slash twist. That's Z-A-P-I-E-R.com slash twist. And they will let you try it free for 14 days. And remember, Zapier makes you happier. All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, our next question comes from Sarah. And she asks me, why do so many investors ask for a notable lead in order to invest? What happened to conviction? This is a great question. Uh, Sarah, we as human beings are pack animals. We like to follow the lead. That's why there is a game called Follow the Leader. Everybody here likes to follow a leader. And if a leader has proven success before and they've done the diligence on a deal, Sequoia, you know, Ruloff, uh, Doug Leone, Michael Moritz, Jim Getz, uh, or Aileen Lee at Cowboy, um, or Bill Gurley at Benchmark, or Chamath Palihapitiya, or Rick Thompson. They're going to look at those individuals and say, those per people have won before, therefore, they do the work and they're likely to win again. And if you're a passive angel investor, you're going to look for leadership, people who have access to deals you don't, 
and people have a rigorous process of selecting those deals from a massive amount. Uh, so following a lead investor um, is a great idea for passive investors. There's another reason, the number two reason, that people like to follow a lead is because a lead investor, once they're in the company and on the board, they're going to shepherd it. You get Bill Gurley on that board. You, you get Chamath on the board. You get Aileen Lee on the board. You get one of these great investors. You know that they're going to be in contact with the founder every day, every week, and they're going to be at those board meetings shepherding your investment. So there's two reasons that people like to follow a lead. Really three. One, human nature, and then the two practical ones. The lead has better deal flow than you, and they have a better process for picking companies. And then two, Oh boy, when they're on the board, they're going to start connections and people might follow them. So now you've got the leaders getting more investors following them. When I was invested in by Sequoia for my last company, I had 20 firms contact me after the announcement came out saying, hey, you want to get coffee? Because they had anointed me. Now, I agree with you. What happened to conviction? Well, there's just a lot of investors out there who don't want to do the work and build a huge basis of uh, deal flow, and they just follow. So uh, it is a uh, it is a challenge. I uh, like to be a person of conviction. I like to make my own decision. I take my own counsel, which means you could be you could do worse than to follow my conviction because I got a good track record. And so there are people who lead. There are people who follow. There's a lot of capital out there that is that are not meeting with thousands of companies a year. They do what's called hang around the rim. What does it mean to hang around the rim in basketball? There are people who will hang around the rim after somebody else shoots in the hope <clears throat> that if there's a rebound or a putback that they can do. In other words, the shooter misses the shot. They can grab that basketball, put it back in the hole, or get the rebound and pass it back out to the shooter. It's called hanging around the rim. You're looking for a winning shot. You're looking for a winning shooter and trying to help them out. So it's a, it's a viable strategy to hang around the rim. There are late-stage funds that all they do is hang around the rim. They wait for Sequoia, they wait for Benchmark to make an investment, and boom, they try to just pile on into that investment. It's a great question, and um, yeah, there's a reason. And it's a, it's a real reason. Okay, let's take another caller. All right, we've got a caller calling from Syracuse. Snowy Syracuse, Amr Amrit, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Okay, how much snow you got this season so far? Uh, it's not snowing right now. Okay. It's totally, it's like totally warm. Okay. It's cold, but... So, All right. Well, we'll stay say uh, stay warm in uh, Syracuse. You have a question for me. Let's hear it. Yeah. So the question is that I'm an international student here in the U.S. So basically, international students they come on an F1 visa, and on an F1 visa they cannot generate income off campus. If they can generate income, it's on campus. So let's say if a student has a startup idea or a project, a side project, and they want to get out out in the market, and if they generate income out of it, it basically con gets considered as an off campus um, off campus. Um, employment and that generates our immigration status. So, how can an international student, while being here in America on an F1 uh, visa, how can they run the startup and generate like? Uh, how can they run the startup here? Yeah, it's so a great question. question. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, we have very stringent uh, immigration policy right now under the current administration. It's uh, 2020. Uh, enough said. Uh, so, what a lot of people are doing is moving to Canada. And Canada is more than welcome to bring in a lot of uh, talent and uh, start companies there. They really want people to do that. They want to increase their tax bases and innovation. And that, I think, is the unlock for a lot of people trying to come here. I do think there might also be a possibility for you. And you probably want to check with an attorney uh, or your immigration attorney about this. But if you had a co-founder in a company and they started the company and you worked on the project with them, I wonder, I don't know for certain, if that would be a possible, um, I don't want to say loophole, but a possible way to do this and stay compliant. The other possibility is since you're in school, maybe you should just do a project. In other words, make money one way and then you're, look at your startup as just a project. It's not incorporated, it's a project and you're building it not to make money, but maybe to just test your theories in a lean startup, you know, experimental way. And then when you graduate, you're going to go for that next visa, and then you can obviously do it totally legally uh, and not have a problem. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. that I mean, it, it's unfortunate, but right now we are 
not allowing into the country the next Sergey Brin. Uh, Steve Jobs' father was an immigrant. Elon is an immigrant. David Sachs was uh, an immigrant to this country. So we really have to get our head straight in America and understand that immigration equals opportunity, not just for those individuals, but for all Americans. Because the greatest companies, some of the greatest companies in the history of this country have been immigrants. I'm curious, what kind of business are you building? So it's basically trying to digitize the college ID, the traditional college ID. You want to digitize a college yeah, ID? Put it on the smartphone. Yes. That is a brilliant idea. Um, and you, if you did have the college ID on your smartphone, you could open up the doors on campus, you could check into classes, you could order food, you could order books, you could take out books from the library. What a brilliant idea. If you have this brilliant idea, here's a, here's a little idea for you. Start it as an open source project. That would be a way for everybody to feel comfortable buying into it. Colleges love open source. So make the standard. You know how HTML is a standard, RSS is a standard, OPML is a standard. And there's tons of open source projects from WordPress to Linux. Make an open source standard while you're working in school. You get credit for controlling that. And then when you graduate, you could create software and a wallet and apps and the things that the open standard support just like WordPress did. WordPress has org and com. So start the .org version of what you're doing, and when you graduate, then you start the .com once you've got some adoption. And it'll be easier for people to adopt the standard if it's not proprietary. If they feel they can change the wallet or build their own or build it into their app, that would be even better, and you would do something good for the world. So I suggest you start with a .org. Okay. And, and an open standard. You know open standards, right? Yeah, yes, I do. Yeah, embrace it as an open standard. It'll get bigger. And then you just try to extract 5% of the revenue from the open standard as opposed to doing a closed standard that nobody adopts and you get 100% of a small pie. Why not try to get 5% of a huge pie? Oh, okay. All right, good luck and uh, we'll see you soon. And if you want to come to the Founder University, uh, go ahead and go to founder.university and uh, point them back in the application to this uh, call, and I will get you into Founder University. So you can spend two days with me here in San Francisco. Thank you so much. Appreciate All right. It. I can't wait to meet you. We'll talk soon. New year. It's a new year. It's 2020. And the new year is about growth and change. And if you are running a startup, like all the people listening to this podcast are, LinkedIn is going to help you find the talent you need, the right hires, we're going to set you up for a strong year. And let me tell you something. When you get that right person in that right position, oh, it's so great. Isn't it the best feeling when you make a great hire? Well, LinkedIn Jobs screens candidates with the hard and soft skills that you are looking for so you can hire the right person quickly. I know. Usually you're like, hey, take your time. You know what? LinkedIn is so good, you're going to do it faster. And over 600 million members visit LinkedIn to make connections and a lot of them are looking for new jobs and some of them are passive, right? You get both of those groups of people. A new hire is made. You're not going to believe this every eight seconds on LinkedIn. And that's why it's the number one rated platform for delivering quality hires. At launch, we've made so many great hires on LinkedIn. Our studio director, Sir Charles, our marketing manager, Marlene, she's amazing. And now we're hiring again. Here it is. Associate Press creates a job posting for a new client success position in our Toronto office. Uh, you know, we're growing this podcast. We need to have all of our customers feel successful and, and make sure all their needs are taken care of. And he selects the skills he needs. He writes a description, some screening questions, and then he sets the daily budget. Bing, bang, boom. We're going to fill a position like that. And you can too. LinkedIn is so confident they're going to give you 50, 5 dollars $50. Go to linkedin.com slash twist. That's linkedin.com. It's already in your browser cache. LinkedIn.com slash T-W-I-S-T and you get 50 bucks. I want you to email your friends who aren't using it who are in startup land or big companies and tell them you're going to give them a fitty. So it's a fitty from me, J. Cal, to you and then you give the fitty to your friends. Let's get some fitties flying. Okay, thanks again, LinkedIn. You're great for supporting the podcast. I really appreciate it. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Here's a great question from Jake. He says, what are some easily avoidable mistakes that first-time founders often make? I mean, how much time do you have, Jake? I'm going to just rattle off a couple. Number one, a lack of focus. The companies that succeed focus in on one product, one service for one group of customers that solves a very acute problem for them. 
a significant problem, a problem that they don't have a solution for or that you can build a solution that's 10 times better than a previous solution. Let's take an example. Uber, when it started, had one service, Uber Black. It was the nice Lincoln Town Cars. It was meant for executives going to and fro airports or from meetings who could afford a $100, 50 to $100 ride, black Lincoln Town Car type service. They did not launch with Uber X, Uber Pool, Uber Eats, Uber Freight, Uber uh, Work, They did or Uber Veto, flying cars. They started with one thing. Now, why did they pick that thing? Well, because it was massively profitable. The most profitable segment of all of Uber services is the Uber Black service because it's the most expensive and it's targeted towards senior executives, CEO types, VCs who can take a $150, $100 ride from the airport to their offices and they want to be in a beautiful car. So focus, focus, focus on a segment that really needs you. The people who fail, conversely, try to do three things at once and then they spread themselves then and they don't build a, an exceptional product. So don't spread yourself then is a key, key uh, thing to keep in mind. Uh, number two on this list of things that will make you fail is not understanding your customer. You want to build a product for a specific person. That's why people make personas. And if you look up customer personas or ideal customer profile, these are terms in the industry for understanding specifically who you're building for. You want to build for somebody because if you build for nobody, guess what happens? You're building a product and you're guessing. If you're building a product, let's go back to that Uber example with Uber Black. You have to understand what are the problems that an executive coming out of an airport in a city they've never been to, what are the things when they come to San Francisco that they face? Number one, they don't know the airport. Number two, they got bags. Number three, they got to get to their meeting on time. And maybe they need the person to come meet them with to get their bags. Maybe they need the person to have a quiet, clean car so they can pick up a customer. Maybe they need to make a phone call in the car. There are all the, they certainly need a driver who knows where the heck they're going. They can't risk that. And maybe what are the things they hate? They hate having to do tipping um, with cash. They hate having to fill out paperwork and do the payment and slide the card and wait 15 minutes. Those were the innovations that Uber solved. You knew where your car was on the map. You didn't have to call the dispatcher. Remember back in the day, you had to call the cab company, say, where's my car? Then they would call on some CB radio and be like, where the heck are you? The client's waiting at gate 14. Like, oh, I thought you said gate four. No, they show you on the map and the payment was built into the app and tipping was included. All of those things made the friction come out of it, right? So number one, focus on a specific product and don't dilute it by building three products at once. Number two, understand your customer. How do you understand your customer? You build that ideal customer profile and you don't try to sell your product to people who don't need it. That's a third point that, oh my Lord, people, if you don't pick who your beachhead is, who the tip of the spear is that's gonna use your product, your go-to market customer base, then how do you know who are you gonna go after? If you know that people in New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco love car service and you know that people in the entertainment and finance and music industry and publishing issue industry are the ones who love it most guess what you can find all the people who work at movie studios who work at magazines and newspapers who work at goldman sachs and you can target them first right know your customer and know your go-to market strategy a fourth thing that you need to know as a first-time founder is you have to be able to move quickly speed is important. You have to be able to build products and iterate on them and run tests quickly. If you go too slow, you're not learning enough, right? You're not learning enough. So if you thought your market was executives at Goldman Sachs and you never tested it and never emailed 50 people at Goldman Sachs to get 10 to reply, to get five of them to do a survey or do a phone interview with you and do a listening lab, well, then you failed, right? You failed. So those are the first things that I think are common mistakes. Another one, another mistake, uh, is that people don't do their legal documents correctly and they have to clean them up and they give away too much money on their cap table. You wanna make sure that your cap table is nice and clean. This is like who owns what shares. You're gonna wanna make sure you have the right type of organization structure. That is uh, what's called a C-corp in the business. 
If you're going to raise money and sell shares, you want to have a C-Corp. If you want to own the business forever, just you or you and your partner, you go with LLC because of one-time tax treatment. And so you need to have a good lawyer. You need to have a good lawyer or a good understanding of the legal uh, space. And you get that through reading, going to Quora, listening to our sort of basic series, talking to other founders, and asking questions, super important. So find other founders and be part of a startup group, maybe a mastermind group. So if you're starting for the first time, find five founders who you know and say, hey, let's have a weekly Sunday dinner and talk about our problems and talk about solutions, maybe get in a chat room with them so that you don't feel isolated and alone. And when you do have questions, you can get four answers from your friends and then debate them. That's one of the reasons to come to the Launch Accelerator is that I've got 200 companies in a Slack instance with a channel for accounting, a channel for hiring, a channel for marketing, a channel for PR, a channel for technology, and fundraising. And we all talk in that room about how to solve problems. And it's not just my perspective. Listen, I've got a good perspective. I've got like years under my belt. But that doesn't mean I have the best answer. I have, uh, I have a couple of answers. I have a couple of pieces of information. But I've seen founders give much better answers than I could ever give uh, in our chat room. So you want to build a little group yourself of people you trust and people you can have as a sounding board. And you can do that with an advisory committee as well. And why not do both? Don't be proud. Don't have an ego about it. If you don't know something, if you don't know a word, ask what's the definition of that word. Ask them how to solve this problem and get three or four pieces of advice. And then you can take those three or four pieces of advice and triangulate on the answer that's right for you. Great question. Jake. Do you average eight hours of sleep a night? That's what I'm trying to do. And you know what else I'm trying to do? I'm trying to eat more plants. I want that plant-based diet. I eat gailan. I'm eating some broccoli. I got the broccoli rob. I'm trying to be healthy. And I'm working out over four times a week. And if you're doing that, you're going to qualify for Health IQ. What's Health IQ? Well, it's the reward for having a healthy lifestyle. Health IQ uses science and data to lower your life insurance rates. Because people like us who work out four or more times a week and who sleep eight hours and who eat those greens. We deserve a better rate. Health IQ can save you up to 41%. That's right, up to 41%. Because physically active people, you know this, are going to have a significantly lower risk of heart disease, cancer, and the big one, diabetes, right? Health IQ is not just a lead generator. No, they take customers through the entire application process and the policy is underwritten by one of their top insurance partners. These savings are exclusive to Health IQ. You can get them nowhere else. And you must qualify to get the special rate. You have to qualify. You have to eat your veggies. You got to sleep. All the things your mom told you to do. You got to work out. So here is your call to action. Find out if you qualify as elite by taking as little as 20 minutes to save up to 41%. Is that worth it? 20 minutes to save up to 41% on your life insurance premiums? Compared to other providers, healthiq.com slash twist. That's where I want you to go. Healthiq.com slash twist to save up to 41%. That's right. Healthiq.com slash twist and start the process with the Health IQ quiz. I took it. It's fun. It's easy. And there is no commitment. And you'll learn about more opportunities to be rewarded for your commitment to healthy living. One more time. Eat your veggies. Sleep eight hours exercise four or more times a week, and get rewarded for it by visiting healthiq.com slash twist. It's an incredible service. And if you're not working out four times a week, come on, it's 2020. Let's do this, people. All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, next on the line is Spencer. Where are you calling from, Spencer? Uh, Vancouver, Canada. Vancouver, Canada. It's beautiful up there. You got Slack, you got Microsoft, you got Amazon, lots of people up there, huh? Lots of people. Lots of people. Great city. Um, There's been a ton of layoffs recently, um, and a lot of them do seem to be isolated to SoftBank, but is there actually a lot more uh, systemic risk than people realize right now? Great question, Spencer. Um, We have been living in a free money environment uh, here in the United States and in some other countries around the world where money is freely available at very low interest rates. It's a low interest rate environment. And when you have a low interest rate environment and when you have large Late stage funds like SoftBank was, and it was the largest ever created, obviously, uh, money can flow into startups at an alarming pace. And when you have large amounts of money, that money is being invested so that you can double, triple, or 10x it. In the case of SoftBank, 
they're likely looking to double or triple the amount of money they invest because they're late stage investors. They want to put in a billion dollars and get back three billion, take 20% of the $2 billion gain and make $600 million. That's the game they're in. They're looking to put a billion dollars into a company and have it go two to 10x. They then get 20, 30% of that return and everything uh, will go uh, their way. But your question is, is this a larger problem? The SoftBank companies had too much money put in. It was a big experiment to see what happens if you put $200 million or $500 million into a company. And what you've seen is Zoom Pizza uh, and um, uh, Brandless and a bunch of other companies that received a lot of money realized that they were growing too fast and the unit economics weren't working. And the public markets, as we've seen through Uber's IPO, Slack's IPO, they're not interested in unprofitable companies. Unprofitable companies are going for growth, which is what private market investors want. Public market investors are more risk averse and they want to see profits and they want to know that there'll be free cash flow coming from this service. And that's why you saw Uber go down from maybe a peak of what, $45, $47, all the way down to $25. And now it's coming back. It's now at $34 at the time we're taping this, 2020. It's come back. Because austerity measures, Dara is cutting staff that are unnecessary or redundant. He's getting focused on profitability. So is Lyft. So are the other companies. I'm not seeing it across the board in other companies because those companies didn't overspend largely. But the reality is companies are now looking and saying, the public markets want profitability. The, the invest for the future and growth at all costs era has ended. So you are correct that the growth at all cost era is coming to an end. People wanna see positive unit economics. Positive unit economics means on each transaction, we are seeing a profit. So if you were to look at a business like Uber, obviously Uber Black is highly profitable, Uber X is profitable. Is Uber Pool profitable? I'm not so sure, maybe they break even, maybe they lose a little. Uber Eats and DoorDash and Postmates, they were all losing money, losing $2, uh, per order delivered is what I understand. And previously, people used to make 250 350 per order delivered. So that competition made everybody lose money? What? So that's what happens. When people are competing, they're going for market share and everybody uh, starts losing money in order to gain share. That is a very dangerous game to play. You're going to want to pump the brakes on that problem and then get back to something sustainable. So it's not that people are being laid off across the board in these startups. I think people are just course correcting for profitability. And we live in the lowest unemployment of our lifetime. Anybody laid off from these companies is going to very quickly, whether it's WeWork uh, or Brandless or any of these companies, they're going to find work pretty quick. So I'm not so worried about it uh, in terms of those individual employees. I'm sure 90% of the people who were laid off from WeWork who wanted to find work afterwards have found it by now. So uh, that's one of the great things about the current environment. Uh, the United States and entrepreneurship and the economy overall are very healthy. But the lesson here is it's unhealthy to build only for market share for some extended period of time. At some point, you got to get to profitability. And I think we've pumped the brakes and said, yeah, by year 10, let's be profitable. Let's, let's have some path to profitability. And it's overall healthy. Awesome. Okay. Any other questions for me? What do you do, Spencer? You're an entrepreneur? Um, I, I guess I'm uh, more of a tinker at the moment. Uh, I just finished Lambda school. Um, so the layoffs were somewhat relevant to me. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, How was Lambda school? Lambda school is the code school everybody knows. Yeah, it was a bit of... Uh, I don't think many people um, will really believe in it until I get a job, um, speaking of close friends and family. Um but, you know, I, I definitely feel well prepared um, to go find a job now. Um, but I do have a few side projects as well. What is, it's um, a six-month It's them, a six month, uh, project? It's a six-month program you went through? I went through, uh, it's nine months. Nine um, months. So there's uh, fun, yeah, four months of curriculum, uh, two months of labs, um, which is um, sort of similar to contract work. So um, you'll pretty much get put on a project. Uh, and work with the team and sort of build from the ground up. Um, then there's two months of computer science after that where you learn to sort of deal with uh, um, some more theoretical stuff. And it's $20,000 or so, or you can defer payment. You can either pay up front or give up 15% of your salary for two years. Exactly. 
And when you give up 15% of your salary, it's capped at 30 or 40,000, I understand. I believe, yeah, I believe so. I think it might be 20 or maybe it's 30. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. So uh, the people around you, your friends and family actually thought this was not real, but you had the boldness to do it anyway. Yeah, you know, I was I, uh, I was in business school, and I could like hardly wake up in the morning, and um, I just kept on getting barraged uh, on Twitter with this lambda school, lambda school, um, and I was like, oh, what the heck, I'll give it a shot, uh, and it's worked out pretty well for me so far. Um, I haven't gotten a job yet, but um, a lot of the people I know have. Um, How long have you been looking? Cool. I'm curious. How long have you been looking? Um, so the way the program works is... Um, Essential, almost from uh, month two, you're actually talking to recruiters. Um, so I've been talking to recruiters for months now. Um, I have a few interviews lined up. Great. Where are uh, you based again? Uh, Vancouver. Vancouver, right. Well, there's a lot, a lot of people up there hiring, so I think you'll find a gig. Yeah, I know. I think it's, it's probably a great place to set up an office. Uh, the lifestyle is pretty great. Uh, cost of living are somewhat lower than the Bay Area. Um, yeah, 50% lower, right? Yeah. You can get a fifteen hundred dollar a uh, month apartment. Yeah, about that. Yeah, in San Francisco, it's three, so that's about half. Uh, lower cost of living, and you'll probably get a job within eighty percent of what a salary here would be. So that's a nice arbitrage, and I think that's, you know, I'm advising companies now: don't move to San Francisco unless you really want to be here. And even if you want to be here, you're going to need a satellite office for positions that pay, let's call it. 60000 or less, 50000 or less. It's just not sustainable here in San Francisco. Um, but uh, yeah, send over your resume. Uh, you know my email, jason at calacanis.com. I'll, I'll share it with uh, my LinkedIn with uh, our 200 companies. And who knows, maybe we'll try to get you a gig. Sure. Actually, can I bother you for one more question? Yeah, you can You can bother me for 10 more questions. Go okay. ahead. So, um, no bother. That's what I do I for a living. The last few months, um, called Sweet Bank, sweet, sort of like a hotel suite. Um, sorry, I was, like I said, I was originally in business school and, um, sort of there's a trend happening right now where there's a big push for family offices. Uh, obviously they're quite expensive. Um, not many people can afford them unless you have X million amount of dollars. Um, so I've, I've been sort of tinkering with this idea of setting up family offices and managing over them, them over the internet. Um, and I've been working on that, uh, working on the backend system for that for the last few months. Um, obviously, there's a lot to learn. I'm not quite a finance expert. Um, but to get users, um, what I've been doing um, is uh, on there's a website called Indie Hackers, and there's all sorts of um, online communities where I've been going to these small businesses, uh, online businesses specifically, that are maybe doing uh, six figures in sales. They're profitable, and their owners want to cash out. So I've been offering sort of brokerage services to these businesses just um, sort of as a way for them to exit their business if they want to. Um, yeah, it's a great idea. Uh, I mean, what you're talking about is iBanking, investment banking, but you're doing micro micro investment banking. So if somebody built a project that makes $100,000 a year, $200,000 a year, there are websites like Flippa is another one uh, where people would flip domain names or small businesses. They tend to be a little janky, right? Some of them, but some of them might be real. And um, being able to broker those and find a home for them and you take 30% of the sale price or 20% of the sale price. What's that? I haven't, um, I've actually just been, um, I'm short a few licenses, um, so I have to be kind of careful. Um, so right now I've just been um, pretty much helping them um, write their documents. So say it's someone who's been working on a project for the last few years. And you just charge um, them an hourly fee, of, right? You charge yeah. them 100 bucks an hour to do yeah. that? No, actually I don't do that at all. So um, um, I love most um, brokerages, they charge 15 to 30%, like you said. Yeah. Um, but um, I'm doing it for free right now. I'm quite time consuming. But in return, I just ask for a letter of intent. So when I've sort of gone further down the road um, and I'll be able to um, sort of get my broker dealer um, license um, and actually set up these offices and then um, hopefully hire managers. But right now what I've been doing is I've been using this as a method to get letters of intent. So um, let's say we sell um, a business. Um, you pledge uh, $100,000 out of the sale. Um, to open a sweet bank account. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a great business for you because you will learn a lot. I like those businesses, and it could scale. I also like the business of you creating software for family offices 
that's a good business, I think. Uh, I know they have some family office software out there, but you never know. You might be able to find a niche there. So really just study those customers. And if there are websites that are good at, and you're a coder now, I just love the project of you creating your own website for people who are looking to sell their business and maybe studying the other ones out there and figuring out a niche for yourself. Perhaps you can say, I'm going to work on websites that are just subscription-based, or I'm going to work on just consumer ones. And you kind of carve a niche for yourself and build that platform since you are, you have a dual skill. You're a business head and a developer. That's a really wicked combination because you can conceive of a business and you can build it yourself. You're like a you're like a double threat. Like, you know, in the um in the entertainment business, they have the triple threats. They can act, they can dance, and they can sing. You get that triple threat thing going. Oh my lord. Like the opposite of Justin Bieber, right? He can kind of sing, can't dance, and he's not a good actor. So he's kind of like a 1.5, but you're like a 3.0. You know? You can sing, you can dance, you can act like uh, Lady Gaga or Madonna, right? Like those are the ones you want to be. You're like a Madonna to me, right? So you got that that double skill. I mean, if you can sell too, then you'd be the triple threat. So you can build it, you can conceive of it, run the business. And if you can sell it, oh my Lord, you might be a triple threat. So, you know, I would just keep iterating on that uh, concept. I love the idea of this mid-market kind of space for you. It's a good business Any idea. Any that's the hardest part and help the um, sellers sort of get their docs in order, figure out their financials and such. But finding a buyer is actually probably the most difficult part. Yeah. And that's the most sustainable part. So the way to do that is I would look for companies that are mid-market companies that have done acquisitions in the past. And so I would set up a Google alert for every time the word acquired or acquired this business occurred. And then I would get on LinkedIn and I'd find everybody who's in business development or acquisitions. And then I would just start adding them. I would make lists of those people on Twitter and interact with them. Maybe start a blog or a podcast about people who acquire companies. Here's an unlock for you. If you did the podcast called you know, the M&A podcast, and then you every week call somebody on the phone and say, I have the M&A podcast. I wanted to talk to you about buying and selling of companies. And you do 100 episodes. Now you got 100 episodes of people who do M&A, and it costs you nothing to do those interviews. You get 30 interview, 30 30 minute interviews going. Now you're on a first name basis with people who do M&A for a living. And then when you send them a project, you're like, hey, remember you were on my M&A podcast? Maybe you want to uh, you know, do, uh, you may want to take a look at this company. You might know somebody, right? So building that networking community, you can do it through blogs. You can do it through being active on Twitter. Like you said, you couldn't, you, everybody was talking about, about Lambda constantly. Like the guy, Austin, who was on the podcast, who runs Lambda, his full-time job is Twitter. That's all he does is interact on Twitter and that gets them students. So the playbook is there. Media, community, about the topic with the leaders of that topic then lead to, uh, those people being involved in your platform. It's a great question. It's a great idea. And uh, if you email me, jason at calicanis.com, I'd love to invite you to Founder University or to audit the Launch Accelerator, which happens every Thursday here in San Francisco, except for holiday weeks. If you email me and you remind me you were on this episode, I'll host you at the uh, Launch Accelerator. You can see the companies we're investing in and how they're going. We'll have a burger afterwards and uh, we'll keep the conversation going. Great job, Spencer. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. All right. We'll talk soon. Enjoy Vancouver. For sure.